Good morning. So after we uh, got the energy up, it's time to keep that energy going and uh, introduce our first presenter. Dr. Jan Benedict Steenkamp is the C. Nock Massey Distinguished Professor of Marketing at the University of North Carolina's Keenan Flagler Business School. He is an honorary professor at the European Institute for Advanced Studies and Management and a fellow of the European Marketing Academy. Dr. Steenkamp's work has been featured in Bloomberg Business Week, The Economist, Financial Times, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal, as well as multiple books, including his most recent publication, Time to Lead, which is an amazing book if you haven't read it yet, with a great forward by a certain mission-focused business leader that's in the audience today. I know. <laughs> Finally, he's an executive consultant, U.S. Military Academy guest lecturer and recipient of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Science Mueller Lifetime Prize. Everybody, please give a warm welcome to Do Dr. Jan Benedict Steenkamp. Thank you. Well, thank you for this uh, wonderful welcome. I'm honored to be here at this great conference of the U.S. Air Force. Now, as you may already hear from the first words that I'm speaking, I wasn't born in the United States because uh, you can't lose your accent after a particular number of years. And I was born in the Netherlands uh, and I moved to the US in 2006 and I became a citizen in 2016. Um, I know uh, as a citizen now that there have been uh, in the recent years, uh, certain turbulence uh, in the United States and, and some people saying that, uh, you know, the United States is not all what it is cracked up to be. Um, the United States is not, uh, you know, without faults. Anybody that has read St. Augustine's The City of God knows that there is no state on earth that is flawless. There is no state on earth who never was and never will be. But I've got, been to many countries in, uh, for, for my work on all continents, and I can tell you there are very few nations that taking everything together actually would rival the U.S. in terms of, of its qualities. And I am proud to be a citizen of the United States, and as an economist by training, you have, they use the term revealed preference. It's essentially what do people do rather than what they say. And I can just co but conclude that there are very few people that voluntarily go to China, India, um, uh, Russia, uh, Iran, or even uh, France or, or Spain, you know, the good countries, but, and there are many people that want to come to the United States. So for whatever reason, in my honest view as an American citizen, the country does actually some really good things. <laughs> now, what is my connection to the U.S. Air Force? Um, I'm clearly not a military guy, I'm also not employed by the U.S. Air Force, but without the U.S. Air Force, I probably would not uh, stand here. Um, and for that, I have to go back to the Second World War, when my parents were um, uh, living in, in the Netherlands as teenagers, and, you know, something happened from the mid-1943s or something, roughly speaking, like that. They could he hear the, the, the noise of engines and they could look up far above in the sky and they could say wave upon wave of American bombers flying into that powerful Nazi Germany to attack Germany in its own heartland. And it filled their heart with hopes because finally Germany was being attacked itself by these brave American pilots and they prayed that God would protect the American pilots and bring them home safely to the UK. And we all know, you know better than I do, how many pilots actually lost their lives because the losses were horrendous until the Mustang, I guess, was introduced. Now, when nothing could have been worse, actually the worst calamity happened in the country where I was born, of course not in the Second World War, my parents were teenagers, and that was the darkest moment in Dutch history. And that 
started after Operation Market Garden failed. You may know that is the operation to essentially take all the bridges across the River Rhine, so to be able to attack Germany, that operation failed, which meant that the northern part of the Netherlands, where Amsterdam is situated, among others, remained under German uh, occupation for the remainder of the war. Now, the situation became worse and worse, and the darkest moment is in Dutch history called the Hunger Winter. The, win uh, the Hunger Winter, the Hunger Winter, which meant that in the winter of 1944, there was no food. My mother, living in Amsterdam, um, she had to go on a bike to farmers outside of Amsterdam to trade family linens, family silver for some food. She was, uh, you know, she even had to beg for, for food for the family. And my grandmother made uh, for food tulip bulbs, trying to make something out that uh, I do not know how tulip bulbs taste, but I'm pretty sure they don't taste very good. Now, so actually my mother was in the spring of 1945, literally skin over bones. I mean, if you have sometimes seen pictures of, of Africa, and of famines, etc., that was my mother, that was many Amsterdammers, but my mother is especially important to me. And then something happened. My mother, a very religious uh, woman, she, she's now dead, unfortunately. She was, of course, familiar with the story of the manna that dropped from heaven, you know, to save the people of Israel. And then, in the spring of 1945, manna appeared in the Netherlands. And those are American bombers that dropped food in, 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 in the spring of 1945 on occupied Amsterdam, etc. And my mother was saved, and the rest is history. But my mother would tell this story to us with tears in her eyes. And she instilled, together with my father, by the way, um, both of them instilled in her uh, three sons, a deep love and appreciation for the Americans and for the U.S. Air Force way before I knew how to speak English, let alone I moved to the U.S. and I'm here at this conference. So whatever I'm going to tell you now, moving on to the topic of the lecture, there may be certain things with which you agree. There may be perhaps certain things with which you do not agree. But everything that I will be telling you is with that, oh, this, oh, is that, with that in mind. So please never forget that. This is the, the, not only the loyalty, but the love that I owe to an instrument of our salvation and of my life. Thank you. So now about the topic of, the, uh, of today. This was the situation in 2000. This is the situation in 2010. And this is the situation in 2021. So, and of course, the peer that we are talking about is China. Russia is not negligible, but China is much more powerful in everything, especially when you look at its economy. So I will be talking mostly, when I'm talking about the peer, when I'm talking about an adversary, I will be talking about China mostly. Now, so what we see that in roughly 20 years, China from a relatively minor player has become a real major player in the military sense and economic sense. Now, this happened before. This is not the first time in world history that that has happened. And the last time that has happened was, of course, 100 year, 120 years ago, when the most powerful nation on earth was not the United States, it was Great Britain. And Great Britain had a huge empire guarded by a number of naval bases that you can see that run from Britain all the way to Australia, that those naval bases, they kept the world under, in peace, the Pax Britannica, and it also ran to the, uh, to the West Indies. This huge power was guarded by the Royal Navy, the most powerful instrument of, of war and also of peace that the world had ever seen to that day. The Royal Navy re reigned supreme on all the seven seas of the world. However, not everything was going well for Britain. That is, 
there was a new kid on the block, and that was the German Reich. The point here is that Germany was actually unified only in 1871, and Germany started to develop very rapidly. What we see here is that in, 19, in 1880, uh, Britain was nearly three times as powerful in terms of industrial potential than, it was, uh, uh, than Germany. But look at it, in 1900, the gap had closed a whole lot. And in 1913, Germany was actually slightly stronger than Britain. So we see that in a period of 33 years, not that much different from what we have seen with China, Germany, from really a minor country in terms of power, was really in a position to challenge Great Britain as a world leader. Now, and as with, uh, nearly always goes, economic power starts first and then it translates into military power. And Germany from 1900 on started the program of dramatic naval expansion. And then things starting to become really problematic. That's, in the meantime, the Royal Navy, while strong, had some very significant problems. 100 years of peace and of absolute dominance on the world seas after uh, Lord Admiral Nelson smashed the uh, French-Spanish fleet at Trafalgar in October 1805, the British fleet reigned supreme. So they essentially they had no enemy that they would be really uh, afraid of. And it created a, an atmosphere of complacency and even of conservatism and lack of risk-taking. Because risk-taking, you know, could get you into trouble. And if you just follow the rules, you will make it to the top. They could actually, let's say, accept that because there was no real challenger. So they could be conservative because the, the competition just wasn't there. But that was going to change. The technological gap with the Germans was also narrowing. The Germans were learning, based on their powerful industry, to build better and better ships. So that was a problem for the Royal Navy, and the Royal Navy uh, uh, suffered from strategic overextension. That is that they were patrolling all the seven seas of the world, but with Germany getting stronger, it was getting more difficult to be on the one hand strong against Germany, and on the other hand, be at, uh, on all the seas of the world, be powerful and essentially rule uh, as Britain with a Pax Britannica. So, what is it there? I would say, if I may do it a little bit, and I don't do that in a kissing uh, way, you know, Britain got its general hold. And that general hold was called Admiral Jackie Fisher. He became in 1904 the first sea lord, which is essentially uh, uh, the equivalent of head of naval operations in the US. He became the supreme head of the Royal Navy. And in six years, he pushed through a number of reforms. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of them, but organizational reforms, very difficult to do, uh, a lot of resistance. He, he was the man who came up with the destroyer and the battlecruiser, destroyer to fight torpedo boats. And he redistributed the fleet to the home waters, and he introduced a battleship that rendered all previous battleships obsolete. Now, we're talking about really a radical, disruptive innovation. It was this. I will go into this a, a little bit in, the, in, in one or two slides. This was the world around 1900. Those were the battleships. I also found battleships of American built battleships, but I don't want to put them there because they actually didn't look uh, uh, you know, necessarily as impressive as I would like to project here. This is one of the French's battleships, the Charlemagne. As you see, not looking bad, a lot of different guns, and some heavy guns, a lot of them uh, smaller guns. This was essentially the established battleship. And then, Fisher built the Dreadnought. And the Dreadnought was a completely revolutionary ship. It was the first all big gun battleship that has ever been devised in world history. No small guns, only huge guns. It was unclear whether the recoil would rip the, the ship uh, apart if they would build a broadside. And they introduced new engines, uh, steam turbine engines, never uh, tried out before, but they will be 50% faster. So this was a battleship that was equal to two or three, dependent on the firing position, existing battleships, and was 50% faster. 
It had a lot of other things there, but essentially what it meant is by the introduction of this ship, all the existing battleships could be sent to the scrap heap. You could say, well, this is a good thing. It's actually highly debatable. It is extremely risky. Why? Because this was Britain's situation. It had an overwhelming lead in the battleships pre-dreadnought. It had as many battleships as France and Russia and Germany combined. So by introducing the dreadnought, Fischer essentially at one point brought everybody back to ground zero. Now, he was, he was a very hard-nosed man. And, and, and his language is very colorful. He would say only a congenital idiot with criminal tendencies essentially would tamper with the security of Britain and its empire. And still he did it because he believed as the leading nation in the world, it could not lack in terms of innovation. It had to take the lead in terms of innovation because he was convinced that otherwise other powers would come up with it and then Britain would be left um, in the dust. So the, the, the issue is here, he was very well aware of the, the risks, but he still decided to go ahead, and it paid off. Not too many years later, there was Armageddon on the high seas. Some of you may know it, the Battle of Jutland, the second largest uh, sea battle after Light Gulf uh, in world history, when the British Grand Fleet uh, battled with the German high seas fleet and essentially beat the high seas fleet back, not because the British actually were better gunners or something like that, but the British had so many more dreadnoughts than the Germans had. They had had a lead because they were the first one. They beat the Germans back. The Germans never tried it again. And Britain was able to strangle Germany in a blockade. And the, world, uh, world, uh, the war was won uh, two and a half years later. Uh, there is general agreement in naval circles that if Jackie Fisher had not pushed through his reforms, both organizational and in terms of weapons, it was not at all that obvious that Britain would have won the, the Navy war in, this, in the First World War, and everybody would agree on the following. There was only one man who could lose the World War in one afternoon, and that was the Admiral of the Grand Fleet. If he would have lost at Jutland, the, the First World War was over, and it would have been German world, not an... Um, uh, not, let's say, an Anglo-American uh, Anglo world. Now, what can we learn from Fisher's leadership? Fisher was clearly a disruptive leader. He was not one, you know, 13 in a dozen kind of leader. What can we learn from his leadership? What are key components of, uh, of, of his leadership? And for that, I break it down in three parts. Think, decide, and implement. But before you do anything, you have to think about what am I actually doing? And Fisher was, he had developed a disruptive mindset already from early on. He was continuously thinking about new threats. Uh, he did stints at the, the primary, say, Naval Academy uh, of, the, uh, of Britain, the gunnery and torpedo schools. He ran countless experiments. And he also concluded, thinking about the strategic situation, that Germany was the threat to Britain, and not France and not Russia. Now, you may say that is logical, but think about the mindset. G France and Britain had been enemies with each other for 700 years. They have fought many wars together um, against each other. In just a couple of years before, they nearly went to war with each other on the colonial conflict, uh, 1898, at Fashoda in Africa. So they were nearly, they are there, you know, to, to, to fight it out, not only in Africa, but also in Europe. So this is the mindset, and the, the Fisher was all part of all these things. And still he had the an analytical capacity to identify that it was Germany that was the enemy now, and not France or Russia or something else. The change in a mindset is very important. Now let's look at the second person. Um, uh, Dr. Torino had uh, already talked about him, so I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but there is also an American disruptive leader that um, kind of provides the bridge between Fisher and now. That is General Arnold. Uh, Arnold experimented with drones in 1918 already. 
It's amazing. Not 1918, he came up with drawing the bark, I think he called it. And he had many other kind of disruptive ideas. He made the R&D part of the, the DNA of the US Air Force. And he was a person who surrounded himself with America's smartest minds. You know, uh, presidents of Caltech, MIT, etc. He had the wisdom to know that he could not know everything and therefore let us go up people from academia that will know things to, ha to help my mind. And he was also so wise to say, okay, if I have to deal with an adversary, I need to understand where he comes from. I need to understand his belief. So before he met uh, uh, Marshall Stalin, uh, the Soviet dictator, he even read the books of Marx and Lenin. And he certainly wasn't a communist. But he wanted to understand what does, dr what do, what does drive this guy? What drives the Soviets? Now, then what about you? Now, you, uh, you, and these, uh, of course, that is something, the first two are is called historical facts. The third thing is just, these are things that I just offer to you for contemplation. You have many other things, but um, I think it is highly helpful for, for you to kind of analyze the, the, and understand the interrelations between economic, military, and political power. They're very strongly intertwined. Um, imagine the world of your future. How does the world of your future um, look like? Continually question the constructive way the, the, how the US Air Force is doing its, its, its procedures, its, 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 its manuals, but also its operational procedures in, in, in the uh, in the field. Step out of the US Air Force, and yesterday there were a couple of people on the panel also had mentioned that, and then she talked to people outside of the US Air Force, talk with business people, talk with academics, talk with people that have a different perspective. Not everything is useful, but you get a completely different point of view, which by the way is nearly always how really disruptive uh, ideas come about. Contribute to TTP. You know, yesterday I heard about it for the first time. So, also at a lower level, of course, some of these things that I'll be talking about will be a little bit more at, at a higher level because they're a little easier for me to analyze because then at the lower level you need to know all the details about the organization. TTP is one of these things where you can already have really good, creative, disruptive ideas at, at, a, at a lower level as well. And um, try to get in the mind of our adversary. You cannot start too soon with that. If you, st if you start developing a disruptive mindset when you are at the top, when you are a two or a three star general, uh, I can say it's going to be too late. Uh, simply speaking, because you will be set so much in your, your ways, generally older people are less flexible than younger people. I'm older than most of you, so I can tell you that. And, but the point is, you need to start early on to, to, to develop that mindset early on already working on it. And Fisher and Arnold, when you study their lives, they had already developed, starting developed disruptive mindset at an early instance. You can do that too. Let me talk a little bit about um, your beliefs, <coughs> understanding the enemy. And for understanding the enemy, there are a couple of things that you need to know. I will only take our two. Uh, for John Go. John Go means Middle Kingdom. And that is China. One of the important things in China is this describes 4,000 years of Chinese history. Not 100 years, not 500 years, 4,000 years. Cycle of history, exact map on China. That is first a dynasty a regime starts. It is good, it is strong, and people accept it strong because they want peace and stability. It, the regime brings power and prosperity, economy grows, uh, you know, irrigation canals are dug, or now roads are being built in China, etc. The population grows and so on. After some time, the rot starts to creep in the regime. It starts to become more lax, more corrupt, and 
uh, people starting to be officials are more self-serving as opposed to serving the people. Um, the central government starts to lose a bit of control over the country. And then the third stage is collapse. The regime essentially completely collapses due to civil war, chaos, massive, massive, massive amounts of blood being shed. We're not talking about millions, we're talking about tens of millions of people dying in the, in, in the process. Um, a complete breakup of the country until a new leader emerges. And the cycle repeats again. And this is something. What are some of the implications of this for China, which is imprinted on all Chinese? at least certainly of the, of the more powerful one. First is, my friends, China is very old. It is very, very old. It is 4,000 years old. That's, it is older than any other major proud power, like the UK, like Iran, like France, etc. It's even older than those countries. And for China, History, like for France, is a living thing. It is not a dead thing. For sometimes in America, history is something that is interesting to read in a book. And that is kind of general knowledge, just as that you know, you know the Constitution of the United States or something like that. For many people, and especially in, in, in China, history is a living thing. It is not something of the past. History is relevant for us here and now today. And China has always, in the cycle of history, China has always come back to being reunified. I can tell you one thing. I want to bet with every, anybody and everybody, well, everybody would be too much uh, in terms of money, $100 to 10, China will never, and I emphasize, never give up Taiwan. Because Taiwan is part of China, at least certainly part of China in the last 500 years or something like that. And giving up Taiwan goes completely against anything that the Chinese have done for 4,000 years. And remember, history is living. So, what does that mean? Regardless whether the Communist Party is in power or there is going to be some Nationalist Party or whatever, it is out of question that no government will give up Taiwan. It's important because it has important implications about what we can expect there. In its entire history, China has seen itself as the superior, the supreme power that is surrounded by supplicants. These supplicants, the minor powers, should give it respect, and then China will give it benevolent kind of graces or so. So the point of respect is very important. And I can tell you the only reason why China doesn't treat the United States like that right now is because the Chinese also have respect for raw power. But essentially, this is the Chinese mindset. And this is a mindset, again, my friends, you could say, well, the communist regime is completely different. No, the communist regime is just the latest version of a Chinese dynasty because for China, like for France, by the way, and for England, history is not something that is only relevant for the past. It is driving our behavior now as well. And then loss of control in China invariably leads to chaos. Massive bloodshed. So these are some of the things. And the Chinese leaders are keenly aware of this, the country's cycle of history. They do not believe in the mandate of heaven that underlies this, the theory of the cycle of history. And they have seen in the Soviet Union playing one cycle of history, and they say, we do not want to repeat this. The second aspect is, how has China done in the recent past? Not so good. It's exalted, but it has not so been good. In a so-called century of humiliation, they've had the opium wars against Great Britain, 1840s, 1860s. And it was carved up um, among spheres of influence among the European powers and Japan. Not so nice. And then, of course, the Second World War, when much of China was conquered by, uh, by the Japanese uh, uh, powers. So this recent past, what does that mean? First of all, look at the word recent. We're talking about the last 200 years. That is recent in China. 200 years is only 5% of China's history. 5% of America's history is uh, five times 250. That would be um, 12, uh, 12 and a half years, I believe. Actually, I may be a little bit... Uh, 12 and a half? Yeah, 12 and a half years. That would be 5% of US history. You see, 5% of US history, 12 and a half years. 5% of Chinese history, uh, 200 years. 
Now, this century of humiliation is really felt in China, but it is used by the regime to shore up its credentials and support among the population. China sees the current world order as actually being imposed upon the world by the United States and its allies, but primarily by the United States, and they feel no reason whatsoever to abide by it. Now, of course, if it benefits them, yes, but if it doesn't benefit them, no. So China is actively working to create a new world order, although it, I don't think they really know themselves how that is going to be, but certainly a lot of subversive activity is going on through institutions of the United Nations, WHO, etc. That is because they are not Chinese. And then China sees itself as surrounded by enemies. Uh, you see Japan, then uh, uh, Vietnam, uh, India, and then you have, of course, you have unrest in the western part, Xinjiang and, and Tibet, etc. And then you have Taiwan. Taiwan is the most dangerous place on earth. Because the moment you look at this map, if Taiwan becomes Chinese, the defense ring is broken. And essentially the whole infrastructure in the, uh, to uh, call it contain China collapses. So, what, a second part, so what I'm trying to do here is just that you, for some of you at least that may not know it, um, that you, um, understand a little bit where the Chinese are coming from. So, for example, think about Taiwan. They're not going to give it up. That is, that is going to be, so we need a strategy that is looking at the long term as opposed to at the short term. They are very familiar with the cycle of history, so that means that if they give a power, chaos ensues, which may also gives it a some support. It also it explains why President Xi is having this anti-corruption campaign, because he saw China sliding into from prosperity to the third phase when things were not going so well anymore. So it's all informed by what China understands to be uh, its, its past. But, you know, academics are sometimes criticized, and I, I must admit there is a reason for that, of being good on analysis, you know, perhaps even a disruptive mindset, uh, but not so much on decision. Now, you are U.S. Air Force, not academics, so I certainly think the second stage of deciding should not be forgotten. And look at Admiral Fisher. He made a number of decisions after he did his analysis. He understood it, and then he made decisions, like he adopted many unproven technologies. He accepted short-term risks for long-term potential gain by introducing the dreadnought. And he redistributed the British fleet in a dramatic fashion, which, by the way, was very risky. So this is the situation in 1897. British Empire and the distribution of the battleships. As you can see, all the seas are covered. You have in the Far East battleships to protect the dominions of Australia and New Zealand and the eastern route to British India. You have on the Mediterranean a very powerful fleet to protect the western route to British India. Then you have in the canal, uh, uh, you have a fleet against France. You have a home fleet, and then you have also uh, more minor detachments in uh, the West Indies and, and Africa. But essentially what Britain has done here at the moment when British sea power was at its apogee is essentially everywhere they have the battleships plus other ships as well to keep the world peaceful. 1897, 15 years later, spot the difference. All the squadrons have been withdrawn. Everything except for a few back to the Mediterranean and back to the home waters. Now, why is that? Because Britain could no longer send you withstand the German threat. So they were building very rapidly up their, their naval forces and have these fleets everywhere in the world. Simply speaking, we have here the situation. Britain was strategically overextended. It could no longer do that. Now, this is extremely risky because they, they, they withdrew from the Far East by negotiating a treaty with Japan. I don't think there was ever any trust between them, but it was the best they could do. They withdrew from the Mediterranean by essentially relying on the French to protect the Mediterranean. So, whereas the British then would protect also the French coast because the French withdrew their fleet. So, it was 
they started to build alliances, which they never did before, be, together with a redistribution of the fleet. But I'm showing you this to show how radical that decision is. It may give you a response how much actually America will have to redistribute the fleet at some point. Now, Arnold had many other important decisions as well, um, w which I'm sure that, um, uh, that um, Dr. Travino had talked about. Um, he, he did a lot of important things. And what about you? Um, the strategic overextension of the naval air forces and air forces, um, let's say to what extent my point is here as follows. To what extent is America's situation now in 2021 not similar to Britain's situation in around 1905-1910? That is, Britain could no longer project massive power in all parts of the world. To what extent is a question, you know, and the Air Force can hopefully give insights also to to the White House and others, essentially, to what extent can America project massive force in the Middle East, in Europe, in the Far East, and perhaps some other parts of the world as well? So I think another thing that we have to make decisions upon is alliances, strengthening of alliances with partners in the Pacific uh, countries. Um, I believe avoiding a Kuwait confusion is crucial. Some of you may know the Kuwait confusion, um, and that is that um, the ambassador to Saddam Hussein to Iraq had essentially given very ambiguous signals to Saddam Hussein to the extent that America cared about Kuwait or not. Uh, Saddam Hussein interpreted that as America did not care whether they uh, occupied uh, Kuwait or not. Well, we all know that that was not the right thing, but it led to a war which really nobody wanted. Now, America currently has to be, have some strategic ambiguity vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. Well, it may be that is this the right strategy to follow? Now, I have my own opinion about it, but the point is you have to think about it because you may have a different conclusion. Is it smart to continue to rely on these large carrier-based air forces? Um, or does the protection of these carriers uh, uh, by the, uh, now cost so much that it, it may not make sense that perhaps radically we have to leave the, uh, the carriers. I know the carriers are the Navy and it's not the Air Force, but at least perhaps some kind of mutual understanding could be useful. And then another thing is that I learned yesterday, tools not rules. That is one of the things that can be decisions and that don't only have to come from the top, but also at a lower level that if some of your uh, people uh, is waving with the rule book, uh, rules book too much, that you say, well, actually, no, it's tools, not rules. What, what do you want to achieve as opposed to what, the, what, what does the manual say? Uh, and we also have at the university, we have ma thick, thick manuals. Mine are completely layered with dust. If I haven't thrown them, you know, with the recycling, because I refuse to follow them because, it, I mean, I can't even say, say how bad it is. <laughs> um, they're useless. Um, the third aspect is to implement. Um, it is great to, uh, to have good analysis, the, the, important, to make decisions, but then you have to implement them. Now, what you see here is that Fisher actually implemented all these things in a mere six years. Uh, as Arnold also did it pretty fast, you know, at, 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 in the Second World War. He built the dreadnought in 12 months. The average battleship at that time took 33 months. Why? What did that do? It sent a signal, we can build fast and faster than anybody, and we will outbuild anybody. So it was a very powerful signal to, to, the, to the adversaries that they were meaning business. He's also secured support of the key players. Uh, you know, Fisher was very outspoken, he was blunt, but he had the support of two people that mattered, the king and the prime minister. If he had not had that support, actually he would not have succeeded. And he built up his coterie of essentially the next generation called the fish pond uh, from Fisher. And um, so those leaders would rise 
to lead the Royal Navy in the, in the world war that, that was to come. So he built up at, uh, essentially his own following because he got a lot of pushback from his uh, people at, at his rank, from fellow, uh, you know, four-star admirals is not the right, the right term, but you get what I mean. And he had grit, a lot of it. Now, here is an interesting point. Britain was able to build a dreadnought so fast. And why was it? Because Britain's naval yards were the best in the world. It had a powerful industrial infrastructure. And in the world war to come, it shows up. So when I look at four pieces of, of hardware, let's just look at how much Britain was able to ramp up production between 1814 and 19, uh, 1914 and 1980. We see a massive increase in guns, machine guns, a tank started later, and aircraft. This is testimony to Britain's industrial infrastructure. It was there, and they were able to ramp it up very, very fast. A uh, small thing is that the American pilots in the First World War flew, flew actually British and French planes, not American planes. A slight difference from World War II. This was the situation in the Second World War. See here the difference. Aircraft, tanks, and ships, tonnage. Three things that are relevant that have some information here. Now, they did a credible job in the Second World War. There is no doubt about that. However, look at the difference between the First and the Second World War. The situation here is that Britain was in the Second World War much less able to ramp up military production than it was in the First World War. And why was that? It had let its industrial plans and engineering skills kind of atrophy in the, in the uh, 1920s and 1930s. So that meant that Britain's industrial base was hollowed out, so that when in the late 1930s the government opened up the spigots of money, there was no problem. The, the, the plans were not there. The engineers were not there. It takes time to build plans. It takes time to... Uh, to, to train engineers, so Britain could not ramp up as fast anymore because it wasn't there. Now let's look at what, um, and the second about America. Arnold implemented a lot of things that you may be familiar with. A very interesting thing is this uh, civil training program to essentially an isolationist nation also, you know, getting around the bureaucracy and the Congress, etc. So to train your civilians to become pilots, you know, it is fun to be a pilot. It was just a pre-training for the war that he saw that would be coming. He developed close relationships with, uh, with powerful people like Marshall, Harry Hopkins, and, and others, and the British. He got along with them well, although he didn't have so much a high opinion of the British, actually. Um, and he also followed Marshall's advice, and I actually should have taken that advice more often. That is, don't get mad and let the other fellow tell his story first. That's actually, I think, very wise advice when I read it and I memorized it, the next time that I have to deal with a guy that I believe is a real idiot, and then, okay, let him just blow off steam first. <laughs> and now look at what Arnold uh, uh, did and what America did in the Second World War. We see an, <laughs> just an incredible ramp up of production in aircraft, tanks, ships, tonnage. These are what America did in the Second World War. They are reminiscent to what Britain did in the First World War. That is a ramping up of production that was completely unprecedented. Because let's not be kidding ourselves. Most German weapons were better than the most American weapons. The Panther tank and the Tiger tank were a heck of a lot better than the Sherman tank. But if you have 10 Shermans against one Tiger, I mean, guess who wins? So America was able to produce so much that Essentially, it overwhelmed everybody, and, and, and of course, we thank our freedom for that. Now, the question is, now here in 2021, is America like the UK in 1940 or the US in 1940, or is it like the UK in 1940? So, are we at a situation where we can ramp up production like the UK did in World War I and America did in World War II, or are we in a situation of what the UK was able to do in World War II? Now, I'm not going to give the opinion. I'm just quoting the supreme leader of the US Marines, uh, General Berger, and he is essentially saying we can't do it anymore. He's talking just about ships. 
But he says we don't have the, the, uh, the industrial base is, it, it has shrunk. Uh, the shipyards are not as big as they used to be. Essentially what he means is that if we are going to lose hardware in the war, we cannot as easily replace it anymore and our competitors are probably able to do it faster than we do. Now, I do not know whether General Burger is completely right, but certainly he would not say that if there is not a grain in truth in that. So, there is some real important issues here. Do we still have the industrial base to ramp up production? My answer to that in Dutch directness is absolutely not. And so what can we do about it? I think it's important to, and, and yesterday, uh, General Holt had interview um, with the guys from the venture capital firm, um, I think at least eight VC stands for venture capital, and develop manufacturing plans in the United States again. Also develop engineering skills. You know, to put it mildly, I sometimes am a little bit concerned that when I look at many of the engineering programs, there seem to be sometimes more foreign students from China in these programs than American students. We are essentially training uh, our enemy. It's, it, it, to me, it, honestly, it, it seems a little strange, but I'm a simple guy. And then reshoring, building networks of supporters, because however wonderful the US Air Force is and even the US military, we need to have support in, in, in Congress, in the Pentagon, uh, not in the Pentagon in, also, but uh, in the White House, and that, yeah, that may not be easy, but let's not forget that Arnold, Marshall, etc., they build strong relationship with Congress and with the White House. Otherwise, you know, it's a democracy, thank God. It, it is not going to happen. And you need a lot of grit, uh, absolutely a lot of it. I was with my wife um, a couple of days ago at Bath, Bath and Beyond. And before you laugh, yes, I was hired as the muscle. So my, wa my wife did the, the shopping. I mean, I'm sure that is completely unfamiliar to you. My wife did the shopping and I was there, you know, to carry the things around. While my wife was, uh, 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 you know, choosing a very exciting product called an air fryer, and I was hanging around, you know, like loitering around in the store like a, a really dubious fellow, and, um, and I, I just picked up one thing after the other. I said, you know, where the hell is this, is, is this made? Made in China, made in China, made in China, made in China. Everything was made in China. And then I kind of realized, you know, it is kind of ridiculous because these are all, it's, most of it is, you know, relatively simple kind of uh, uh, kitchenware, etc. But all these plants can be retooled for more nefarious purposes. The plants are there, the engineers are there. Yes, you have to make some adaptations. Exactly what America did in 1940. It retooled the Chrysler and the Ford plants and the other kind of uh, plants of the washing machines towards building military hardware. Essentially, that is going on in China. And, the, and I, I came to that realization first, although at Bath and, Bath and Beyond, I then only understood how widespread it is when it was in the Pearl River Delta some years ago, and it was standing at the top of a building of a Chinese company that was visiting. And I was looking at around at the Pearl River Delta. And as a European, I'm used to the Ruhrgebiet, or the Ruhr area, that is the industrial heartland of Europe. I see from to, up to the horizon, factory upon factory. And then I realized we have lost all this manufacturing capacity because there was nothing there 20 years ago. We have lost all that manufacturing capacity to, uh, to China. And so this is what we are facing. China has not become equal to the US in manufacturing capacity. It has surpassed the US in manufacturing capacity. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that you may not like it, Again, this happened before, this was before World War I, and after World War I it was narrowing, and between World War I and World War II, it was widely, between Britain and Germany, expanding. So in my view, reshoring is not a matter of America first, it's economic protectionism, it is a matter of national security. And I may humbly suggest that reshoring is always difficult, uh, and, and I know, and we can talk long about the economics, etc., about it. But if we are able to communicate that to the American people as a matter of national security, as opposed to economic nationalism, 
there may be much more buy-in to that. Of course, it's not going to be easy, but nothing is easy. And disruptive leadership is not easy, as General Holt will know, but it is necessary. Okay, a couple of um, conclusions. There are troubling parallels between US versus China now and Germany versus the UK before World War I. And America's strategic and economic advantage over China has narrowed dramatically in the last few um, decades. And I think it is fair to say that America would have trouble to project overwhelming force vis-a-vis -vis China uh, anymore. And, and it is getting worse by the day. Now, that doesn't mean it is hopeless, not at all, because real leadership can do something about it. Uh, that is what General uh, Admiral Fisher did. Uh, General Arnold also uh, uh, had to overcome tremendous difficulties. But disruptive leadership, we talked about it, think, decide, implement, and I gave you some ideas, and there are many other ideas that you can come up yourself. And the lives of Arnold and Fisher suggest this is not just academic, you know, uh, far-sighted, abstract thinking. No, these people have done it and have in their lives saved the free world from essentially, in, the, in their case, German domination. Fischer essentially prepared the way for the First World War. Arnold led the way in the Second World War. But importantly, both of these great men, both of them, they started their disruptive leadership and honing their disruptive leadership skills way before they reach the top. If you do it only at the top, it is going to be too late. And I know, I've talked a lot about history. History is not linear. But, I quote Churchill, and he's not the worst source you can come up with, those who do not remember history are bound to repeat it. I will give you just one example, a sobering example. Um, early 2000s, uh, an American friend asked me, uh, you know, America has uh, invaded Afghanistan, uh, you know, will they be successful? How long will it last? I said, I don't know. I know one thing is that Russia, Soviet Union, is a neighboring country as opposed to 10,000 miles away and failed. Britain, neighboring from British India, tried it twice and failed. Alexander the Great, the greatest military genius ever having lived on earth, he, it took him longer to subdue Afghanistan, and he had to marry a local princess, you know, to boot, uh, Roxanne. Then it, then it took him to conquer the rest of the Persian Empire. And I said, I don't think there's any American that comes close to Alexander the Great. No, no offense. I said, simply speaking, based on these things, I believe I would need to be convinced that America can do it fast. Now, I, w I wish, this was one of these incidents where I wish I was wrong. I wasn't. But the moment that you would just have looked a little bit at the history of, of Afghanistan, at least it should be a little bit of a sobering thought. And I just give you this illustration to say that history doesn't completely repeat itself. But from history, we can understand a whole lot about where people are coming from and okay, why would we succeed when others did not succeed? Let us try to identify those factors beforehand, before doing it. Because if we try to figure it out only afterwards, then we may be too late. As, as uh, Churchill famously said, it's easier to start a war than to end one. And, and uh, so that is one of these things. So I want to uh, keep it uh, like here. If you are interested to... Uh, uh, read more about the life of Admiral Fisher and about other great leaders uh, and the leadership lessons, um, uh, then I kindly refer you to my, um, uh, my book. And um, I thank you very much for your attention. And I pray to God that, the, uh, that your initiatives under General Holt to make uh, contracting and faster, more efficient, less bureaucratic, but hopefully also a beacon for other parts in the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. military that it can be done. I mean, it can be done better, it can be done faster, that it, it, that, that may actually affect other parts of the U.S. military uh, as well, because 
We need it, and we certainly don't want another situation like, like Britain in 1940. Thank you for your attention. So, JB, um, you know, I just want to, in front of my family here, uh, my contracting family, just uh, say a couple words. One is thank you. Thank you for investing yourself in us. And thank you for investing yourself and your wife, uh, investing herself in our contracting PhDs. You see, uh, the Steen Camps were the advisors for our PhDs that you saw yesterday. I also want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for who you are and sharing your story from World War II and your parents. We are standing in front of this majestic flag. And you are a personal image of what it is to be an American. Um, and we would do well in these days to remember that the strength and the genius of America is not e pluribus pluribus, it's e pluribus unum. Thank Thanks, you, sir. sir. Thank you.